Hello everyone. Thank you for attending our presentation about high sensitivity troponins launched at Niagara Health. The content has been prepared by Dr. Ben Hainan from cardiology, Dr. Lorraine Jensen from general internal medicine, Dr. Christina Samurai and myself, Dr. Rafi Setrak from emergency medicine. Let's go through our agenda. We will need to try to answer several questions. The first is why high sensitivity troponin and why now? We will then touch base on type 1 and type 2 myocardial infarctions, as well as talk about chronic myocardial injury. We will talk about the concepts of delta troponins and how they apply in the Niagara Health algorithm approved by MAC. Next, we will, <clears throat> we will talk about implementation timelines and what to expect post-implementation. Let us first talk about why high sensitivity troponins. There are several benefits to be realized from using higher sensitivity troponins. To the left of the slide is the definition according to the ACC guidelines from 2018. In essence, using high sensitivity troponins offers improved discrimination at a lower diagnostic level of cardiac enzymes. It allows detection of smaller infarcts and the use of accelerated diagnostic protocols in the emergency department. It improves ED efficiency and throughput, all while increasing accuracy of diagnosis. One of the other benefits of high sensitivity troponins is the high precision of the assay. These are two examples of two patients. In the TN line, it's showing the levels of standard TNI assays results as they fluctuate over time across the diagnostic cutoff. This is a common finding that we find in practice. The orange line represents the results of high sensitivity troponin over time in the same patients. These tend to be much more accurate and precise, helping avoid this type of misdiagnosis. As for the question why now, it is basically because the manufacturer will stop supporting the traditional TNI assay as of this month. Some of our sister hospitals, like Hamilton Health Sciences, have already moved to high sensitivity troponin. Others in the region will be following suit quite soon as the support to the test ends. With the simultaneous implementation of a diagnostic protocol with high sensitivity troponins, we are hoping to reduce the length of stay of chest pain patients in the emergency department, increase our sensitivity in diagnosing myocardial infarction, and improve our practice by creating pathways that differentiate between different patients with elevated troponins. Let's talk about the concept of type 1 versus type 2 myocardial infarction. We have long known that elevated troponin does not equal acute myocardial infarction. In fact, to, to assume that is to do our patients a disservice in subjecting patients to cardiac admissions and cardiac workups when they actually require alternative managements. Type 1 myocardial infarction is the classical infarct caused by acute coronary thrombosis. To make the diagnosis, one needs to find dynamic changes in the level of cardiac troponins. These need to be accompanied by symptoms consistent with myocardial ischemia, new ischemic changes on ECG, or the eventual development of a pathological Q wave, or imaging evidence of new loss of viable myocardium. There is an eventual identification of a thrombus by some kind of angiography. Type 2 myocardial infarction are not caused by an acute cor coronary thrombus, but rather by a mismatch between myocardial oxygen demand and supply. There could be a stable background coronary insufficiency or not, depending on the clinical scenario. While there would be one or more indication of cardiac ischemia on investigation, there would be no thrombosis on angiography. Sometimes a diagnosis cannot be made until an angiogram is completed, like in the case of a coronary artery dissection. In both type 1 and type 2 myocardial infarctions, there needs to be a dynamic change in measurable troponin over time. In the first phase, there is a rapid acceleration of troponin levels followed by a short plateau and then a gradual decrease of troponin levels. These dynamic changes of either increasing or decreasing level of troponin over time, shown here by the purple line, are required for the diagnosis of myocardial infarction. In cases of chronic myocardial, in myocardial injury, or what we sometimes refer to as chronic troponitis, there is persistent measurable troponin at the level above the 99th percentile of normal that does not change over time. In essence, in approaching the ED evaluation of an acute chest pain patient, 
the use of delta troponins at two hours represents a differentiation point between acute and chronic troponin elevation. There are protocols that use delta at one hour. After review, uh, the committee has decided to go with two hours to increase diagnostic certainty. Chronic elevation is measured, uh, <clears throat> sorry, is managed through treating the underlying condition, if possible. An acute elevation, on the other hand, indicates either a type 1 or a type 2 infarct. These two are differentiated on ECG and clinical features. Sometimes the differentiation is quite difficult. For type 1 myocardial infarction, the treatment is that of acute coronary syndrome with ultimate revascularization. However, the diagnosis of type 2 myocardial infarction brings us back to the same approach we took to chronic elevation, which is the treatment of the actual underlying condition. It is important to remember that the algorithm has been developed with extensive review of literature concerning acute chest pain or chest pain equivalent patients in the emergency department. It is not necessarily applicable and should not be simply migrated to use in other patients like perioperative patients or in patients who develop chest pain. Having discussed all that, let's move on to the most important part of the presentation. This is the Niagara Health High Sensitivity Troponin ED Decision Making Pathway. This was developed in collaboration between the Emergency Department and the Department of Cardiology. It has been approved by the Medical Advisory Committee and indicates an acceptable standard of practice within the organization. Let me take you through it. The first part of the algorithm reminds you to activate the STEMI protocol if a STEMI is diagnosed on the ECG in a patient with ch acute chest pain or chest pain equivalent. We encourage you to use the Smart AMI app to activate the hotline and send your ECG to the interventionalists. Also, we remind everyone about using the words code STEMI when calling EMS to assure timely transfer. If there are no clear indications to activate the cath lab, then a high sensitivity troponin is performed both at time zero and time two hours with an ECG. Serial ECGs are recommended for uh, for, uh, for example, uh, at both time zero and time two hours. This, but they should be done more frequently if dynamic changes are suspected. You can apply the Ottawa monitor rule to decide which patients require monitoring in the ED. You should start your management of the patient depending on the clinical manifestations and the patient uh, and your clinical suspicions of possible pathologies. No decision algorithm can substitute your clinical decision making and and uh, and acumen. From here on, the algorithm moves into three possible outcomes. There are three possible outcomes. One, in which you have ruled out acute myocardial injury. The second is where you have ruled in a myocardial injury in a type 1 myocardial infarction. A third, where the results are non-diagnostic. At this point, we want to remind you of the important differential diagnosis to cons diagnoses to consider in acute chest pain to the in the emergency department patient, shown here in the blue box in the lower right side of the slide. These need to be entertained during clinical assessment and pursued if clinically reasonable. Look at the column to the left side of the slide. To rule out myocardial injury, there should be no ischemic changes on the ECG. The guidelines have intentionally left those cl to clinical interpretation. Also, you need either a negative troponin at time zero, or T0, if the chest pain had started more than six hours, or both negative troponin at time zero and two hours, T0 and T2, where they are both negative and there is less than 20 nanograms per liter of change between them. Some algorithms, like that of Trillium Hospital, use higher levels of 30 nanograms per liter for a delta troponin. At this point, it is recommended that you use some sort of risk stratification if in those patients who, in which you've ruled out a myocardial injury. You can use, for example, the heart score. It is well validated in emergency department patients uh, with acute chest pain. And then for final disposition, you, can, you have options of no immediate care or further investigation for low-risk patients, uh, for moderate or high-risk patients, consultation or referral as an inpatient or an outpatient may be warranted dependent on the clinical presentation. Let's move to the middle column. These are the, this contains the criteria for ruling in an acute type 1 myocardial injury. 
This happens if there is a T0 or a T2 um, of over 120 nanograms per liter. So either of them, you've made the diagnosis. You can also make a diagnosis if the delta T between the two is more than 20 nanograms per liter, regardless of their level. In this case, the diagnosis of myocardial injury is made. ACS pathways will be initiated and consultation to the on-call intern internal medicine or cardiology is made for further management and care. In the left column, there are the indeterminate patients. These are patients who have no diagnostic ischemic changes on ECG and where the T2, T0 and T2 are <clears throat> sorry, less than 120 nanograms per liter but are above the cutoff for gender and there is no diagnostic delta. Those do require further detailed clinical assessment and reflection. The algorithm reads, leads you to the larger group we found <clears throat> to have positive troponins inconsistent with ACS. Let's talk about a large group of patients who will be found to have a positive troponin level but have no type 1 myocardial infarction. The reasons for elevated troponins are many. They include cardiac strain from things like pulmonary emboli, tachyarrhythmias, and sepsis. Other causes of elevated troponin include chronic renal failure, perimyocarditis, CHF, cardiac procedures, cytotoxic medications like chemotherapy, aortic, aortic dissections, defibrillation, severe anemia. Management of these conditions and evaluation of these conditions is much more nuanced than to be put in a simple algorithm. However, as a rule, a persistently elevated troponin of a delta T less than 20 nanograms per liter is likely to be caused by a chronic myocardial injury or a chronic condition. Many of these are not treated and treatable in the ED and the management being the treatment of the underlying con condition. One should consider appropriate outpatient management and appropriate referral if possible. This group includes those indeterminate patients from the previous slide. When, however, the change in troponin is acute and is more than 20 nanograms per liter, this indicates a likely type 2 myocardial infarction caused by demand and supply mismatch. It is imp important to differentiate this condition as the treatment is again not that of cardiac conditions, but rather of the underlying pathology. These presentations are still acute and they will likely require inpatient management. Consultation with your critical care or GIM physician is warranted depending on the presentation. The last part of the algorithm is the footnote, where you would find some information like the cutoff values of high sensitivity troponin in both males and females. We understand that this algorithm looks complicated at first class. However, we are confident that put to the test in the real world, it should create a more streamlined differentiation of patients, as well as act as general basis for collaboration and, and care between the ED, cardiology, critical care, and general medicine. Next, implementation timelines. High sensitivity troponin will be replacing the old troponin assay on March 29, 2020. 21 at about 7 or 8 a.m. in the morning. This change will happen in the background. In order entry, trope HS will replace trope in all Meditech orders and order sets. So whenever you order a troponin, the entry will be trope HS. The same change will also happen with, with directives for sepsis, CHF, uh, and uh, where a trope, a high sensitivity troponin, will be replaced. Uh, will replace the regular troponin. One main difference uh, in uh, a, will be uh, is the change in order sets in the emergency department, sorry, the change in directives for chest pain and ACS in the emergency department. These directives will produce a T0 and a T2 labels together. They come out as a set. The labels for both components are printed automatically once the directive is implemented, and the primary nurse caring for the patient at T0 and at 2 hours will be responsible for arranging that the samples are, samples are collected, labeled, and forwarded to the lab. This is 
a, a change from the current workflow that all of us need to be aware of. As delta T is the actual parameter being measured in patients coming in with acute chest pain or ACS. And that is why it is important to collect samples at T0 and at two hours so that the difference between them can be meaningfully interpreted. What to expect from implementation? There's always worry about increased utilization, increased consultation, and increased admissions. We do anticipate a first period of one to three months of uh, sort of turbulence. After that, the evidence that is published shows that you actually end up doing less stress tests. And if you look to your left here, you will see that there is probably about a 30% reduction in number of stress tests being done with no change in the angiography and PCI procedures done after migrating from a um, regular troponin to a high sensitivity troponin. There are many other public publications that deal with uh, uh, with the implementation of high sensitivity troponins in emergency departments to, um, to talk about length of stay and reduction in length of stay. This is a, an example of one that was just published about two months ago uh, in the Journal of uh, Academic Emergency Medicine. In this study, the effect on length of stay of patients was actually minimal, uh, leaning towards an increase of a few minutes, uh, but there was also an increase in patients undergoing two sets of troponin instead of having just one troponin done. This indicates an improved practice um, uh, as the average of troponin assays done per patient increased from 1.1 to 1.9 assays per patient after the implementation. Before implementation, 86% of patients who had a troponin done only had a single assay done. This is compared with 36% only after the implementation of a, of a diagnostic protocol. What is interesting in the study is that there were about there was about a 6% relative reduction in admissions from 54% to 51%. This translates to about to avoiding about 1 in out of 20 admissions for chest pain simply due to the implementation of a high sensitivity troponin with a diagnostic protocol. Thank you very much for taking the time to going through this presentation. Uh, we know that you might have a lot of questions. Uh, you will find our emails uh, on the slide. Feel free to, to email us and we will try to get back to you with the best answers uh, as soon as we can. Thank you again for your time and attention.